right, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining. Thank you for the speakers for supporting the event. Uh, I'm Lucian Fogoros. I'm the co-founder of IoT World, and and I want to thank the sponsors of this event for for making this possible. And we'd like to introduce Dr. Irene Patrick of Intel Corporation, who will moderate this uh, last track of the day. Uh, enjoy it and and, and have a great uh, session. Thank you, Lucian. I appreciate it. Um, as uh, Lucian said, my name is Irene Petrick. I'm with Intel Corporation uh, in charge of industrial innovation uh, in the IoT space. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to this session um, about how AI and manufacturers can harness it in, in these times. Um, today we have five speakers, all of whom bring years of experience to this topic. Uh, I'll be introducing them each of you to I'll be introducing each of them to you directly prior to their presentation uh, and then we'll have time for questions after that last presentation so post your questions in the Q&A window. Um, our first speaker is uh, John Morris. John is publisher of datadecision.com which is a community dedicated to exploring data to decision value chain. Data decisioning podcasts have included interviews with execs from Forrester, Capgemini, Gartner, Microsoft, among others. John's background is 30 years of experience in business development at vendors including Oracle, Intalio, and Bosch, uh, covering business and financial services, manufacturing, and supply chain kinds of activities. John, I can turn this over to you now. Thank you very much, Irene, and I look forward to uh, sharing some insights with everybody here. I uh, just want to do a voice check. Am I uh, live, please? Yes, you are, John. Yeah, great. And we'll just uh, flip now to the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, and I want to make sure that uh, we are screen sharing here. Uh, can we see the, uh, do I have con uh, ability to advance the, the slide that I'm seeing then? You should John, you should advance your own slides now? Just one moment, please. We'll make sure that. Uh, Just click on screen anywhere and you, you take control of my screen. Okay. And on the bottom left corner, there you are. You're, you've got a couple of arrows, so that's it. Okay, very good. Terrific, thank you. I appreciate that. What's this about business side managers leading an AI program? Doesn't AI mean you have to hire hard to find data scientists to lead an AI program? Sure, an AI program needs technology and AI specialists, but what an AI program really needs is to be business driven. In fact, your knowledge of manufacturing and business is exactly what an AI program needs. We're going to learn why. And then we're going to learn list nine things that you and your business leadership role can do to help push your AI program forward successfully. Before we get to the nine things though, let's review where AI adoption is today. The IIoT world track on AI and manufacturing comes at exactly the right time because just earlier this month, we saw this from the Economist quarterly technology report, a whole section on AI pessimism. It's a great read. And what do we say in response? Bring it on. It's the time we've been waiting for. And why? Because of the opportunity for business people to get to work. And specifically, that means business people taking responsibility for their AI programs. The simplest way of expressing what business leadership for an AI program means is to say, no black box. No black box means you have to look inside AI and you have to take responsibility for what's in there. <clears throat> and the great thing is, what's needed is all about what you already know, your business and engineering knowledge. We have one more thing to do before we get to our list of nine things, and that is to provide some context on why management and business knowledge is so important for AI right now. So what justifies our claim that what AI needs is what business managers know? Let's start with the technology adoption curve made famous by Jeffrey Moore in his book, Crossing the Chasm. The graph shows enterprise populations according to their business models. Some people are innovators and some people take a long time to climb on board. 
Now let's add another familiar curve, the hype curve, or as you know, Gartner's hype cycle. We drop the hype curve on top of the technology adoption curve, and wow, the hype curve sits very nicely on the left slope of the technology adoption curve. That batch is not just geometry, but actually reflects the relationship between the two curves. What the hype cycle is measuring is something different. The hype cycle is measuring social signaling. And so early adopters get all excited about new technology coming out of labs. And then the media gets excited too. And there's lots of articles and posts and conferences. And in parallel in the real world, the tech is stress tested by visionaries and early adopters. And then it happens. Social signaling falls off. This is not unexpected. But does it really deserve the label of the trough of disillusionment? That's way too negative. I don't even think it's accurate. It's the trough of something else. How about instead we think of this new phase as time to go to work? Because with any new technology, after we learn how it works, then we figure out how we can use it. AI has come out of the lab and there's lots of evidence of viability. So we can be disillusioned or we can get to work. So what kind of work do we need to do now? Are you ready? The work of business analysis and engineering and productization. Regardless of how you acquire your AI via make or buy, you'll need to contribute the business and engineering knowledge for AI to become useful in your environment. So the message is, it's time to get to work. You have your motivation for business transformation and you know that AI will be part of that transformation. So let's explore nine ways you can contribute your business and engineering knowledge for a successful AI program. Here's the all important step one, start with decision making. Decision-making is the how and, who and why of AI. Let's start with an AI anti-pattern. An anti-pattern is a popular and tempting way of doing the wrong thing. And the wrong thing about AI adoption is magical thinking. Here's an example. AI will enable us to deliver better customer service. Not really. Between AI and better customer service, there's a leap from technology to outcome. The actual work that AI helps you with is missing, hidden by the word enable. So what about the success pattern? The core AI success pattern is AI enables better decision-making. That's it. And then following along from better decision-making, good things happen. For example, we get better customer service. The link between AI and decision-making should make managers happy because management is all about decision-making. And now we have a technology that contributes exactly to helping managers make decisions. But looking more deeply into our black box, we ask, how exactly does AI help with management decision making? We have two little formulas here. Number one, AI equals cheaper prediction. And then number two, prediction plus judgment equals decision. These formulas are based on the work of Professor A.J. Agarwal of University of Toronto, who explains that the business meaning of AI today is primarily about cheaper predictions. This is the economics of AI. But a prediction by itself is not useful. Prediction, according to Professor Agarwal's analysis of management decision-making is always paired with management judgment. Of course, you knew that already. Management judgment is the key here. Judgment based on the hard-won knowledge of engineering and business. Then when the value of AI is realized, sorry, when the AI generated prediction is combined with business judgment in support of decision-making and with the falling cost of AI-based predictions, we can enable managers to make more decisions, faster decisions, and decisions of increasing quality. It is primarily through decision-making that AI works. Decision-making support should be a management-driven first-class citizen and focus of any successful AI program. Step number two is own your big data. Of course, uh, because of course, AI predictions need data as an input. So let's open up the uh, black box of big data and we see again that business knowledge is the secret to getting value out of big data. If you want to drive any given decision, you need to have the data that aligns with your decision-making needs. Let's see how that alignment happens. And let's start by asking about the business meaning of big data. The business meaning of big data is interesting. Everyone will say that big data is the three Vs or the four Vs, volume, velocity, variety, et cetera. These are all very important, but this is not the meaning of big data. That's the meaning of all data. All data has the Vs. It's just the ante to play the game. The real meaning of big is too big. Big data is too big for compute, for storage, for memory, for bandwidth, and ultimately for our time and our budget. How can we economically get those predictions we talked about if we can't afford the data? The simple inevitable answer to the big data problem is throw away some data until it fits. 
but when we throw away what we throw away has business implications. You can't do a prediction if you've thrown away the data on which the prediction is based. For example, it's hard to detect an event, detect an event that requires a day's worth of data if you only can afford to keep a rolling hours worth of data. Of course, we can sample, but sampling also requires a deep a priori understanding of data. You can't ask data scientists and business analysts to just do your data and expect good business results when there are important trade-offs to be made around the cost and use of big data. Big data questions are business questions. Step three is invest in your own business knowledge. The anti-pattern is take a machine learning course. I'm sure many of you have been pitched as I have on taking a machine learning class. That's great, probably a lot of fun. But just like every business person should know accounting basics such as cash flow, every business person should also know statistics and the basic of, basics of AI as machine learning. But beyond the basics, there's a comparatively poor ROI in learning more about machine learning. We should focus on what we know and uh, say in manufacturing management because this field is completely demanding in and of itself. And this applies both individually and at the firm level. Your IT and data science people need you to help them plan sampling and data management, and they need your help building in business and industry knowledge into AI models. If you're going to win with AI, it will be in part because you pushed your own business and engineering knowledge beyond what everyone at your competition knows. Step number four, own your AI models. The AI model is where I trained machine learning AI in just data and outputs and prediction. We've done data to predictions. Now we have to own the model-based transformation in the middle. So what are the dimensions of AI models that business people should engage with? Number one, the model has to perform. There has to be accountability. And what about robustness? With COVID-19, apparently a lot of consumer machine learning models are now useless. Transparency, the acronym XAI or Explainable AI has received a lot of attention in the last year, especially in the B2C space and concerning bias. And what about flexibility? What are the chances that you got the business and engineering right in your first time out? These are all aspects of AI model usage. Business input is also needed for AI model construction, especially for the new generation of semantically enhanced AI models now beginning to appear. If you're betting on AI, you're betting on your AI models. Do you think you can do your AI models better than the competition? The 80-20 rule applies. Everyone can do basic machine learning. Congratulations, you're now on the level playing field with the competition. To win with AI models, business people must again be engaged and be ready to contribute their knowledge. Step number five, don't drown your users. The anti-pattern here is actually a very popular use case. With every new piece of equipment needs to signal its state, a light, a sound, a message, but the aggregate behavior of your entire environment is that decision-making capacity becomes overwhelmed. The economic principle is data is cheap and business analysis is expensive. And the inevitable temptation is to add ever more data outputs on some system. What's the business leader's role? Again, start from decision-making. Are you helping staff and leadership make decisions or are you building a decision prevention service? You might think that alarm fatigue and related syndromes are a corner case, not really a top 10 concern. They're included here because the anti-pattern is so common. And the solution, of course, is funding the business analysis that integrates all your relevant business and engineering knowledge. Step number six, pursue a strategy of augmentation or AI as assistant for existing work. The most successful AI use cases are task related rather than grandiose replacements for entire processes. Remember what AI does is a prediction generation technology. So search your work processes for opportunities to help with prediction. What tasks or jobs can benefit from better prediction? Augmentation is dependent on a deep understanding of business and work processes, which only you can bring. If you stick to a strategy of augmentation, you likely find a steady stream of projects with good returns. Step seven is about solving your data governance issues. Earlier, we talked about the use of data. In this case, we're talking about data as infrastructure. The problem is this, data quality across so many organizations leaves so much to be desired. This can be a source of AI program risk. The anti-pattern is a persistent problem though. And why is this? Why is data quality a near universal problem? The short answer is no one owns data quality. 
here's the idea. Data or data quality is infrastructure. And there's no business case for infrastructure. If a business case is defined as something that can be funded out of operations for a one or two year horizon at most, then data quality will never be funded. We can solve data if we can treat data as infrastructure and then invest. This means, of course, you need board level support. Try making an investment case for data because better data supports better decision making. Good luck with that. I didn't say it would be easy. Whoever solves the data infrastructure funding problem will beat the competition. Step number eight is ironic, given that most people here today are in manufacturing, because the idea of AI ops refers to the idea of manufacturing AI artifacts for sustaining innovation. The AI ops idea has evolved from DevOps and data ops. It's the idea that technology infrastructure is constantly evolving and an IT department or an AI function is following a cadence for delivery of new automation and technology artifacts. The idea of AI ops as manufacturing is attractive. It implies manageability and scalability. This is very important because there's more and more evidence that mature AI programs are not scaling as hoped. The low hanging fruit has been picked. AI is ops is one attempt to address this. Don't forget to ask who owns the AI artifacts manufacturing pipeline. Step number nine, this is the bonus round. Research by Capgemini going back to 2014 on business transformation shows that successful transformation is usually top down, leadership driven. This applies to AI too. AI has the potential to speed up individual functions in any organization, but if done opportunistically, it's quite likely that the result will be destabilizing. So as things speed up, make sure that your new AI superpower is helping your organization go in the intended direction. As they say, if you don't know where you're going, you could end up anywhere. What a fantastic opportunity. The hype is fading. Existing technologies have been proven. It's time to go to work. This is the time of business analysis, engineering, and productization. And it's all about a step-by-step -step realization of the promise of AI. And that happens when business leaders engage deeply in AI programs. And we've shown what the AI program success patterns are from data to model to production to governance at every step, business knowledge makes the difference. The key is starting with a focus on how AI supports decision making and then finding those process tasks where AI can make a difference. Add your knowledge, take ownership, and help guide your organization on a deliberate path for AI achievement and know that you can make a difference in the success of your AI program. Thank you. John, thanks very much. Um, if you have questions, please uh, post them and I will cover them toward the end of our session. Our second speaker is Ganipatha Pulipaka. He is an SAP specialist uh, with Accenture. Uh, he's a chief data scientist at Accenture. And he's a chief data scientist and brings over 21 years of experience in machine learning, AI, and data science. Ganipatha, I'll turn it over to you. Hi everybody, this is uh, GP here. Today we're going to talk about uh, IoT and AI at the edge. So primarily uh, this discussion will be about a project I implemented a few years ago for um, an aerospace company. I'll be referring to the company as, uh, uh, just for the sake of discussion, as Aerospace Corporation uh, without the actual name because of confidentiality. And uh, there are a few phases for this project uh, from the discrete manufacturing and uh, how the uh, IoT sensors for the industrial IoT and manufacturing um, have been implemented and uh, what are the challenges in terms of the technology as well as uh, the business requirements and the IoT, the initial IoT especially leads to creating lines of uh, new business models as opposed to be uh, only uh, uh, serving the existing type of uh, business lines that are out there. So we will see how basically we're gonna navigate through the aerospace landscape and uh, try to find out the new product line and business opportunities here. 
And uh, for these corporations, what are the sales and future growth opportunities that uh, can be powered by technology? And uh, so basically this uh, company that uh, this project was implemented for, uh, primarily they are manufacturers of the uh, panels. Uh, the panels are part of the aircraft and uh, so they manufacture like panels on laminates, honeycomb, SP metallic and non-metallic fabrication, precision, machining. Uh, so that's what uh, this customer uh, uh, manufactures for the aerospace industry. And so primarily there are a lot of challenges. Any infrastructure can go through aging and uh, it, it's really hard to know when exactly these uh, panels have to be replaced in the aircraft. Most of the time the passenger, passengers get stranded in the airports not knowing if there is a mechanical uh, problem with their aircraft because the panel has some issues and uh, they are unable to move forward with it. So this is a novel solution where uh, there will be IoT sensors that will be installed into the panels that will uh, take uh, uh, different types of readings to come up with a strategy. We'll go through that as we go forward. So primarily, um, so there, there are different types of techniques and algorithms that have been applied uh, to uh, install those IoT sensors and get those readings, leveraging statistics, AI, and uh, computer science. And we will go over, uh, uh, briefly on uh, those technologies, how uh, uh, it can be accomplished. So this, company has been manufacturing panels over decades and decades, but they haven't thought about this uh, new business line of opportunity with uh, IAOT. So this is where uh, the IAOT comes to the rescue and invents new types of uh, business lines for this uh, aerospace corporation. And uh, the proposition is primarily to build an IOT software suite uh, powered by the AI. And uh, there will be also IoT sensors, which are like hardware uh, that will be installed through the panels. And also it helped the aerospace to launch another line of business where primarily they'll be able to manufacture the hardware uh, sensors as well, uh, along with the uh, software suite. So as I was discussing about any engineering infrastructure can undergo aging, damage, and deformation over a period of time because of the pressure and load supplied on this uh, surface. And aerospace industry is no exception. So they demand highest uh, structural integrity so, so that uh, the predictive analytics can provide some type of uh, forecasting on the future probability trajectory to foresee any type of damage and what we can do to prevent it before it can actually happen. So that, that type of disasters can happen, especially when uh, the panels have been there for a while and there is no way to identify when are they gonna break down. And if it happens, the, the entire aircraft is basically stranded in the airport for hours and hours. So to resolve these type of problems, uh, the solution has been implemented. And again, the cost to measure the structural integrity uh, through personal inspection is very high because there are so many quality hours that people have to spend in reviewing all of these uh, issues with uh, the panels. And uh, even then, there is no way, a scientific way of coming down with uh, uh, the infrastructure damage that can cause. So basically the solution is to power the aircraft panels through the AI and then measure the structural integrity and uh, that helps them to move forward. Uh, and also uh, that will reduce this uh, manual work of the maintenance crew weeks in advance. So uh, primarily this particular company that I work with, we built a uh, set of devices and IoT sensors and AI software for them by transferring the data and evaluating the structural integrity and predicting the load on the structure and coming up with uh, special readings uh, that can provide this type of uh, um, reading. So primarily what we leverage is uh, machine learning and fractal geometry. Fractal geometry is a special type of mathematics that can detect any type of uh, damage coming from the infrastructure. Like for example, if you have a panel, so if 
starts reading the meter, meter readings of the IoT sensors from the beginning, it has some structural integrity. And then there is acoustic emission that comes uh, with a certain parameters in the beginning. And then if there is any change in terms of uh, the acoustic emission from that particular panel, and it can detect the change, and it will uh, basically record those uh, readings. And also through vibration, because when we have like a stronger structural integrity, there is a special type of vibration that it can produce. And as the uh, infrastructure goes through fatigue and it gets damaged, then we see some sort of uh, a difference in the vibration. So basically these sensors help to measure the structural integrity and the vibration through fractal geometry and machine learning and provide the most accurate information. So they tell, okay, this panel is gonna break down like somewhere three months from today. So within the three months, they have the opportunity to uh, fix it if possible. And if they think that it is something they cannot fix it, then they're gonna simply replace the panel. So these are panels everywhere, like door panels or uh, floor panels or the, the ceiling panels, any panel inside the aircraft. So that's what uh, has been implemented here for this. And uh, so basically the, uh, so there are different types of techniques uh, to measure such type of uh, surface damage or the three dimensional surface damage because it's not like we can just measure uh, the, uh, just the top surface to come up with any uh, such kind of uh, uh, errors. So basically there are different types of methods we can adopt, but for example, we have box counting methods uh, from the fractal geometry that can provide different types of quantitative analysis for the structural integrity. And then there is three-dimensional fractal analysis that can study the fractal dimensions of the structure. And basically um, it will uh, transcribe the big data with different types of readings from the time of uh, structural integrity versus uh, uh, when it has versus what it is to do. So again, there is a micro topography of the surface and depth parameters that will be recorded in the beginning. And those will be captured and uh, measured again uh, in terms of the, the structural integrity time to time. And again, uh, the good thing is they don't have to actually go and measure it physically. Everything is connected to the cloud. And uh, these uh, meter readings will simply be uploaded to the cloud computing through the satellite and the data gets transmitted in real time uh, to the ground stations. And then it goes to the aerospace corporation and they have a separate uh, software suite, which has been installed for different airports. And they just uh, get the meter readings and they understand, okay, this is the structural integrity as of today and uh, how they can uh, basically understand the strain and damage conditions of the panel. And if they were to uh, do that, then they can simply replace the panel before it even breaks down. So there are different types of uh, methods as I explained again, there is uh, acoustic emission that can be captured by these uh, IoT sensors, especially the optical based I IoT fibers. Um, those are very, very sensitive to pick up uh, any type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, minute anomaly in the uh, panel, like whatever that it finds the like acoustic there's a change in acoustic emission or there is also vacuum monitoring. So when it has like highest structural integrity, it has an amount of uh, uh, vacuum versus when it goes through the damage, then it has different type of vacuum. Also again, leveraging the fractal geometry, it can monitor the vacuum and come up with uh, such type of uh, readings. And again, there are different types of uh, sensors here that can be adopted. Some are very expensive options and some are like, they can be the economies of scale, for example, like fiber gears and different types of things. So again, coming to the context of uh, uh, a research study here. So primarily, uh, if you look at a research study uh, on the bridges, recently there has been a breakdown on the bridge and uh, it has been successful. Like uh, there is a sense spot wireless IoT sensors that were installed that were like uh, basically uh, five milliliters thick. And uh, these uh, sensors of uh, SensePark uh, barely cost like uh, 20 bucks and uh, there are no uh, wires or no batteries. They're just self-adhesive and they just pick the energy from light and radio waves and they just provide the meter readings for bridges. So 
extending from the aerospace all the way to um, uh, the uh, uh, bridges. So this technology can be applied to any infrastructure. It's not limited to any uh, particular uh, type of uh, industry. The next slide, please. So again, uh, here there's more information provided on uh, you know what type of panels that we worked on and what where we installed all of this. Uh, this is just too much of uh, technical information. So we will uh, go to the next slide. So this is a geospatial intelligence suite that was built, and uh, so primarily the IoT sensors uh, can uh, capture the aircraft performance by connecting to the cockpit. And uh, uh, so, so this is just gives you a brief idea of uh, uh, the type of components that, that are available. So again, um, so there are different types of, uh, these are like the future phases of the project that have not been implemented, but that were proposed. That was the only initial phase that was implemented. But uh, what I'm going to talk about here is uh, more opportunities where it can be implemented with uh, different types of technologies. So again, when we are installing these panels, these panels are uh, made with metal and aluminum and different types of materials. And it really can make the plane heavy, but there are other type of uh, options that are available. For example, like there is graphene material, which is pretty lightweight uh, material and it can uh, totally uh, reduce the weight of the aircraft by infusing any of such uh, uh, graphene materials into the composite structure of the aircraft. And uh, so these are the other options. And uh, so if you see also the industry where people are implemented, IBM and Airbus are a partner and they basically uh, build some uh, sensors in the planes that will uh, monitor the smart fuel system. And uh, they put like 10,000 sensors in the wings of these uh, planes. And that will basically uh, provide the safety and tracking uh, fuel system. So again, these are in experimental stages from IBM and Airbus. These are not fully gone commercially live, but these are the type of uh, innovations that people are also working on uh, geospatial intelligence and uh, smart fuel systems. And there are also several hundreds of airlines that are uh, looking for a smart fuel system. So whoever uh, gets it right and uh, releases a product with uh, um, you know, uh, in, a, in a way that is more, I can meet the economies of uh, scale, this industry can really, really go um, uh, towards uh, uh, the age of AI and IoT. Uh, that's where a lot of uh, aircrafts are experiencing challenges right now in terms of MRO, the maintenance, repairs, and the operations of the entire aircraft. So it can cut down millions of dollars when these can be installed for um, all types of aircrafts. Okay, so this is just a, uh, basically uh, our project timelines of what we implemented it. Uh, we can skip through this. So primarily the centralized business leadership makes the decision in terms of uh, uh, when the project has to start and uh, when it can be implemented. And uh, um, so most of the organizations uh, uh, rely on the centralized business leadership where the business leaders uh, can uh, basically tap into the potential of uh, uh, industrial IoT and see how they can benefit uh, for their manufacturing or maybe it is robotics where people can implement or it could be uh, some of the other stuff um, that they can automate with IoT. And uh, so there's so much of data that's generated from the uh, planes and this data can have lots and lots of information in terms of like uh, like uh, most of the stuff uh, people study uh, from the black box is not giving the information in real time because it's more like reactive that people get the black box and then they try to start analyzing it, not knowing the cause of the crash, but having a geospatial intelligence platform on the aircrafts can help people to get the uh, live data and understand and prevent the situation. Like if they need to detour it because the plane runs into some sort of a storm or something, they understand the weather pattern is much better when they're in the air versus uh, when they're predicting, applying different types of uh, reinforcement learning algorithms like temporal difference and all. It requires some more data before they can predict what's, what's gonna happen on the specific day. 
But this technology, it gives hour by hour, minute by minute, and it allows them to detour from uh, different types of storms and um, it helps them to uh, prevent any such collisions in the air. If there are any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to ask. GP, I'm going to ask that people hold their questions. We have a couple here uh, already and we'll put we'll answer those all at the end of the session uh, so thank you very much uh, our next session uh, actually is two presenters we have Isaac Bennett and Mo Abwali uh, who will present together uh, Isaac is currently the digital transformation IOT manager at Detroit manufacturing systems uh, once again, with over 20 years of experience in the automotive industry in various roles, uh, Mo is the CEO and managing partner at the Internet Company, with over two decades helping companies in multiple manufacturing sectors. Uh, I'll turn it over to Isaac and Mo. Hey, thank you so much, Irene. If there's an opportunity to share the screen, that would be great. It should be sharing now. So, Mo, you're on control. Uh, no, sir, please. I'd like to share my screen. Thank you very much. All right, let's start. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this presentation. Uh, thank you for IIoT World. Um, I'd like to uh, give a preface to the presentation before handing it off to Isaac. Um, we, as the Internet of Things company, our DNA is manufacturing. Uh, we focus on supporting uh, manufacturers today to create their digital transformation strategy. And in doing so, um, we rely on digital tools like predictive analytics, AI, industrial IoT, and of course, education and training around Industry 4.0 and digital transformation. So our goal from today's presentation is really three, four things. Um, I'd like to preface the conversation and, and just give definitions around what is industrial IoT, what is the fourth industrial revolution, and what is predictive analytics and the technology surrounding that and then handing it off to Isaac to talk about their journey uh, within their automotive facility on how they were able to uh, realize digital maturity within their operations. So let's start. Uh, the field of IoT is by no means a new field. Uh, it's been around for decades, uh, maybe under different namings and different conventions, but uh, there has always been data collection, especially in safety critical industries like uh, aviation and uh, and jet engines in the sky and, and, and monitoring of power plant operations, for example. But taking those solutions into industry is the field of industrial internet of things. And when we look in a manufacturing operation, we see multiple layers. Uh, we see the machine layer, we see the data acquisition layer, we see manufacturing execution systems that are tying data from the plant floor to the top floor, which is your business systems, your ERP systems. And Industry 4.0 is an initiative, um, initially a German-born initiative that has uh, spread. And in the United States, for example, the National Association of Manufacturers, NAM, uh, they refer to it as Manufacturing 4.0 Initiative uh, within industry. And when we, when we look at an Industry 4.0 strategy and what we call a digital transformation strategy, we really look at four pillars of that strategy, and that'll be part of our conversation today and the case study that Isaac is gonna go through. And if we start from the right and we count backwards, um, ROI first. Uh, first and foremost, uh, how do you measure success? What is the business case that we're trying to solve? We always look for the ROI before we start going into the technologies that may help you realize that ROI. So once that business case is in place, we're able to start talking about getting connected, collecting the data, creating the data lake, making sure you have real-time information captured from the factory floor. And once that connectivity is in place, we talk about analytics. We talk about performance analytics, like measuring the overall equipment effectiveness, your OEE of your factory and your operations. We talk about predictive analytics, like using artificial intelligence to look at machine health, performance, and prediction of remaining useful life on the factory floor. And then once it is proven in a small scale, as they say, think big, start small, scale fast. We talk about scaling that technology and selecting the right technologies that can meet the needs of the manufacturer 
especially when we're talking about enterprise scalability of that solution to multiple manufacturing sites. So keeping those four things in mind, let's start with the business case. The business case drives any future conversation in any industry today. And we always have a vision and the vision is driving towards a zero downtime, zero defect operation. Okay. Zero downtime, zero waste. What is, how do you measure success? Are we looking at improvements in uptime? Are we looking at reduction in scrap? Are we looking at optimizing spare parts? By being able to predict future issues on the machine, we can drive predictive replenishment of spare parts. We have many manufacturers that are able to reduce spare part inventory by using analytics and moving from a reactive time-based maintenance approach to a proactive and predictive and prescriptive maintenance approach that can impact you optimizing your preventive maintenance schedules on the factory floor, optimizing labor, uh, optimizing spare parts. And we have manufacturers that have been able to uh, optimize maintenance to the point where they have eliminated overhead maintenance. They've eliminated the need to do maintenance over weekends. And they've been able to do optimized maintenance scheduling Mondays through Fridays as an example, right? So it's important to understand the business case. Are you driving towards uh, uptime improvements? Are you driving towards quality improvements? Are you driving towards visibility? And this business case, ROI-centric thinking, allows manufacturers and industries today to start se connecting the right assets, selecting the right assets, using the right metrics, and then driving AI on the factory floor. So let's talk about technology briefly. Zero downtime, zero defect operations drive industries today towards a worry-free manufacturing process. And when we look at the deployment of AI today, we see three steps. We see a data lake, connectivity, getting the right data from the factory floor. We see the actual AI, the algorithms, the software, the hardware, the sensors that go with it. And we see the use cases that are the ultimate outcome from deploying AI. Let's start from the left collecting machine data from the CNC's, from the PLC's, adding sensors to the machine if required, tapping into process parameters, looking at worker data, and in, in the case of uh, scrap or quality issues, you know, tapping into vision cameras and understanding defect information on parts that are being produced, and then crunching that data, ingesting that data, digesting that data, converting that data into useful information and useful metrics, using artificial intelligence, machine learning, and analytics to drive use cases that can support the manufacturer to meet the business case defined. And two of the most commonly used use cases today are predictive maintenance, looking at the health of the asset, predicting the RUL, the remaining useful life of when this asset might fail, before it fails, and diagnosing what is the critical component of the asset that might be leading to the failure. Predictive maintenance. Next, predictive quality. We work in some scrap rich operations. If you look at high pressure die casting or injection molding, you have scrap rates of 9%, 10%, and in many cases, it's considered industry norm, okay? It's industry standard. So how can we use data analytics? How can we map machine data to quality and defect data and be able to predict on a machine that you're going to meet to make a bad part and maybe even make a change to the process on the fly before the actual part is produced, before the part goes to the next machine in the value stream. And then obviously the cost of reworking and fixing that part exponentially increases as it goes down the factory floor and it becomes a traceability and a warranty issues when it ships to the end user, to the end customer, right? So predictive maintenance and predictive quality driving zero downtime, zero defect operation in manufacturing today, but business case first. And once the business case is defined, a manufacturer can clearly understand where to start. We don't believe predictive analytics is a big bang approach. You will not be deploying AI in a factory with 100, 200 machines and lines. You need to find the right place to start and start there and deliver the business case. Do you have robotics? where the axis or the joint on the robot fails? Do you have CNC machines where the spindle bearing might cause the tool to unbalance or chatter, which might lead to a defect on the machine and then a defect on the part being produced? Do you have casting or molding machines where you can collect 50 to 100 process parameters 
and you're making wheels or aluminum cast parts at a very fast cycle time. In automotive, this can be in seconds. Do you have stamping machines where there might be issues with the die on the machine itself, or there might be issues with the carriage or some critical areas on the machine itself? We're using acoustic emission sound to listen to the hit on the stamping press and to actually get an indication from the sound, the harmonics of the press, whether you're making a good part or a bad part. It is non-intrusive. You do not need to even add vibration sensors on the machine. So we believe that the deployment of AI using data science and machine learning should be templatized. There are, should be templates. There is proven knowledge and domain experience out there that take us away from doing a data science project into doing a proof of value project where you can actually deploy and realize AI on the factory floor within weeks, not within months and years, and therefore driving down the cost of AI adoption on the factory floor. And this is just an example. You know, there are, in a machine itself, a CNC machine, for all those machine people on the call, there are critical components of the machine. Where do you want to start? Do you want to start on a spindle bearing? Do you want to start on a ball screw? And then what are the critical measurements from the machine that should be captured? What is the data model? What is the most critical process parameters that drive predictive maintenance on a machine tool? And then how do you realize it? And my last comment here is user experience. And Isaac will talk about the people side of things, right? Um, maintenance people on the factory floor, uh, they are not PhDs and data scientists like myself or some of the people on the call, right? They're looking for intuitive solutions where you can look at the data, trust the data, and take actions based on the data. So at the end of the day, I think it's important to ask ourselves, what is our level of digital maturity? The success of an industry 4.0 or an AI strategy on any manufacturer today is based on three fundamentals. It is based on technology, but also process and people. And people process technology are a three-legged stool and finding the right recipe to marry those, those three parameters can lead to a very successful and scalable digital transformation strategy. And with this, I'd love to pass this to Isaac. Isaac is the Director of Digital Transformation and IT um, at uh, Detroit Manufacturing Systems. And he'll surely talk about their Industry 4.0 journey and how they were able to master the, or start to master the people process technology side of digital transformation. Isaac, up to you. Yeah, a more view of a, like a personal story of, of a personal journey of, of where uh, I have been and where we are going now in my current position with uh, smart manufacturing um, and in particular with uh, machine learning and AI. I'm the head of IT of Detroit Manufacturing Systems and if you go to the next slide there, Mo, um, just a shout out to Detroit. Um, Detroit Manufacturing Systems is not that old. 2012 uh, is when they were established the idea of bringing uh, manufacturing back to the city of Detroit. So yes, uh, Detroit Manufacturing Systems is in the city of Detroit. Um, they have plants in Detroit and Toledo, and they do value-added assembly uh, and injection molding. You'll see a couple pictures there of a, of a cockpit that we assemble with the Ford product, and then on the right in the Toledo facility with a Jeep product. You can go to the next slide. So yeah, just want to tell you uh, from, from an IT perspective, but also just a um, uh, <clears throat> perspective of somebody who's gone down this path and this journey. I think five, six years ago, I was going to conferences like this, trying to figure out what to do. And the reason why um, I got involved with digital transformation and, and this industry 4.0 is I actually managed um, IT people in manufacturing facilities uh, in Europe, and, and we had a plant in South Africa at that time when I was with uh, Maxi on Wheels. The message that I got from the plants at that time was we really need uh, IT to be more involved with uh, the production floor and, and what's going on with production, because I think at that time they started seeing a knowledge shift and, and a shift in, in, in the technology uh, in the world that, hey, there's some tools that we could be using in the manufacturing environments. Um, and what that journey and what that conversation turned into is me going to my CIO and having a, a good discussion about what IT can bring to the production and, and manufacturing environments. And that turned into us developing a presentation 
about smart manufacturing, about industry 4.0, about IoT, um, about machine learning, all those concepts came into that, in, into that meeting. That was a, a really good um, presentation that we gave to the top leadership and had very, very positive feedback at that time. And then the question was, well, what do we do next? And the thing that we realized pretty quickly, and, and Mo, Mo talks about it, people, process, and then technology, we realized pretty quickly that we don't collaborate very well from, a, from an overall point of view from digital transformation. Um, we don't collaborate very well. Uh, we're in silos, doing our jobs in silos, um, but you know, data wasn't a focus. Um, we weren't collecting data, and sometimes we're collecting it, but just uh, we're collecting it because it, it's a, uh, uh, something that we're required to do. And then as far as manufacturing execution systems, we didn't have any um, motivation a lot of times in facilities to put those um, uh, systems in place. Um, so we realized really quickly that um, we needed to change the way we did things. So if you go to the next slide, Mo. And so when we're talking about Industry 4.0, it's a big, big, big picture. Um, it's a lot of different concepts. Artificial intelligence is in there. Machine learning is in there. Data analytics, big data. It's kind of overwhelming. So as you're um, going down this road, I felt the same way. Um, really a lot of different things coming at you, a lot of different technologies. Um, and me, even as an IT person, um, it was a bit overwhelming. Um, but when you really break it down, uh, what Industry 4.0 is, is it's, uh, the core of it is data and analytics. And of course, data and analytics brings you to um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And really, the goal is to generate knowledge from data. So you see that quote on the right side, um, knowledge from data to transform the company into a learning agile organization and enable rapid decision making and an adaptation process through every part of the business and across all business process areas. Um, so that's what really it's all about, it's, it's about the data. When I started this, it's not like I had a data uh, cloud and, or any kind of data analytics going on. So again, you kind of try to say, okay, where do I start? I'm feeling overwhelmed. So if you go to the next slide, Mo. So what we did, did very much realize was that if we're going to collaborate, break down those silos, that would have to happen if we're going to do this. We're going to have to connect the data together. And in order to do that, you talk about people. It was very much a, a compelling case um, for, for collaboration, compelling case for um, the company becoming more innovative um, and, and getting everybody strategically aligned. Um, you know, you talk about certain devices um, and, and enablers just in your home. Uh, a lot of people these days have um, their smart home devices and it's starting to connect things together. So that's from, from a connectivity side and a technology side that is bringing collaboration with you in your home. But how much more can you get in a company uh, when people start sharing their knowledge and their data and then automating that and connecting it together. So you go to the next slide. So really, we wanted to see where we were in this path and, and we wanted to see what our maturity levels was in, the, in, the, in our plants and our facilities. But then also we wanted to say, this is where we are now and where do we wanna be in the future? And if you look on the right side there, really, I would say most facilities today are reactive automation. Um, they do have some standalone um, automation. But then if you really want to look at where we want to be and sharing data and collaborating, you go through that uh, one, two, three, four, five. In the end, it's not just about connectivity in a plant. It's not just connectivity in uh, multiple plants, but it's connecti connectivity of the entire ecosystem. Um, orchestrating the entire ecosystem, using that data to automate just about anything that you can think of, um, and, and, and then even developing new business models in the process. I'll go to the next slide. So this was, a, this was a, one of the biggest silos that we needed to break down, and I know everybody in manufacturing is facing this these days, is that the technology on the plant floor is getting 
it is bleeding into the IT field. So the operation technology is bleeding into the IT world. And a lot of, a lot of times there's banging heads um, in those two worlds because they got two kind of different philosophies. But we found out really quick how much important it is that we make sure that we're breaking down those silos um, in the IT domain and the OT domain um, and making sure that we do it in a safe, um, secure way that we're not um, um, putting at risk anything on the plant floor, but then also being able to pull that data off and make use of that data all the way through, you know, this is the picture of the automation pyramid. So all the way through from, from the sensors and the plant floor, PLCs, CNCs, all the way through um, the enterprise resource planning um, software that you're using. And we really felt like um, in some of our plants, we didn't have a manufacturing execution system where we felt like that was kind of the gateway for uh, getting the data off the plant floor, but also um, breaking down that silo and IT and OT can work together on that system to collect the right data at the right time, uh, display it, put it on and on screens, but also feed it into your ERP system, and then really start getting some value from that data. But for me, that's step one. That's just visualizing and getting the data. So if you go to the next slide. So really, and, and Mo talked about it, you start breaking down those silos and you have that philosophy of thinking big, start small. And I put fail small on there because um, it's okay to fail. Inno innovators have to fail. In order to innovate, you have to fail. And so it's important for me, I think, to put that on there. But once we prove the value and you, and you're, you already have that big picture and, and you prove the value, then you can scale fast. And, and we're doing those things uh, from an MES perspective, making sure that we have a modern MES system in that is breaking down silos and getting the correct data that we need at the correct time. Um, and then also um, in the current facility we have, we have a um, data collection that we need to get from injection molding and we don't have any MES on there either. So we're implementing an MES on there. And the future is to start doing um, some AI for predictive maintenance and predictive quality are in, in, on our injection molding machines. Go to the next slide. So I wanna talk really quick about two specific um, uh, pilot programs that we did that were very successful. Um, and I'll tell you, it's, it's all about the think big, start small philosophy. And we kind of learned that philosophy after having many discussions with, with Gardner experts and doing a lot of research on the best way to attack um, Industry 4.0. And so what I did is I went into a specific facility in Akron, Ohio, and um, had discussions with those people on the plant floor, asking them specifically on your plant floor, what are the issues that you're having? And we narrowed it down to um, a roll forming machine that they had uh, breakdowns on that would cause a uh, complete line stop. And when we did that, we then brought in um, some, some guys from IOT Co and, and sat down across from them. And we had that discussion of, okay, where do we wanna focus? So it wasn't even that specific machine that we focused on. It was two specific parts of that machine that we focused on. We narrowed it down to the upper tooling and, and the lower tooling of that particular machine that we wanted to focus on. So it was a very, very narrow focus. We knew we had other machines um, in the environment, in our, in our company that we could replicate this. Um, so one of the enablers these days is that sensors are not so expensive. So that's the, one of the things you think of a, a, a machine learning AI project and in industry 4.0, you kind of get the, the eyes with the big price tags. And one of the enablers for manufacturing to get into this now is that sensors are very inexpensive. Um, they're getting less expensive. That's the way technology works, right? You get a new TV uh, one day and then two years later, it's, it's half the price. The same TV is half the price. So we're getting into that um, zone where we can get these sensors and throw these sensors. And so this machine was very, very old. It was like uh, built, uh, set there in maybe the 19, late 50s or 60s. So very, very old machine. We were able to put sensors on them and start collecting vibration data and torque data. And, and, um, and then also we were able to spin up a uh, server in the cloud fairly quickly and get that data off of those sensors and put it into, um, uh, the machine learning algorithm and start um, start preparing the model that we needed for that particular machine and those two particular uh, parts of that machine. 
It hey, is very, very- Isaac? Yes. I hate to interrupt you. You've got about a minute left before I'm gonna need to curtail this and get the next speaker up also. Sure. Thanks. Yep. So, so we were able to uh, train that model and um, the great story behind that was uh, the, the model predicted that in 10 days that those particular uh, parts of that machine were gonna fail and indeed they did. And we did a similar uh, project um, with our casting machines but this time we wanted to predict when that casting machine casted a part, would it be a good part or bad part? And so that was kind of the predictive quality part of, of a project that we did where we just picked one casting machine, collected that data, and then started comparing whether the wheels were good or bad and then training that model. Um, so the idea was that we wanted to have um, some templates that we could use that we, once we proved the value, we could go across the company. So you can go to the next slide. In fact, <clears throat> Mof, yeah. So this is the, the last slide. I just wanted to say, um, really, the call to action is, um, it doesn't have to be a big science project. Um, you have to have the big picture, but you can start with a small project, start with one of the big problems that you know you can replicate um, across the company, um, prove the value, and then, and then scale fast. And uh, we used kind of this model as we went across the company. Um, so, um, I always appreciate listening to Mo. He's very passionate about um, machine learning and AI, and I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak today. And uh, I hope everyone has a good day. Thanks, Isaac. I appreciate it. Um, our, our final speaker in this uh, session is Dr. Chetan Gupta, who is the Chief Data Scientist and Head of Industrial AI Lab at Hitachi America. Uh, he brings more than 15 years of experience to this machine learning and analytics topic. So I'll turn it over to you, Chaitan. Thank you, Irene. Um, happy to be here. I think uh, a lot of what was said today uh, was quite pertinent to the talk uh, that I'm going to give. Um, there was a lot of talk about uh, a lot of the projects being science projects and folks still figuring out uh, how to make um, uh, these projects successful. So at Hitachi, uh, we have been um, doing customer projects in the industrial IoT space for close to six, seven years. Um, and I've seen the journey uh, from several years ago where folks didn't really know how to use machine learning AI. Could have uh, much more success in projects um, that are being operationalized and folks are using uh, the output of the machine learning models um, to make uh, good decisions. I think there's something that I think Steve had said out, or John had said out very early, right? That machine learning gives you prediction. What you really need at the end of the day is a decision. And I think organizations that are able to incorporate machine learning AI into their decision-making processes uh, will be the ones that will be successful in the long run. So let me um, go back to the previous slide. So this is a little set level set. Um, sorry about that. Just to level set, um, there's a lot of hype around AI, as someone pointed out earlier. Um, and if you think about where we are, right? So machine learning, AI, it's a vast field. It's, it's not new, starting statistics. Um, and then uh, we have data mining and the sort of traditional machine learning, as it is called. And finally, we have what we call AI right now. Um, been doing this before this became so hot. But, um, and people often think that the value is only at the very end, like autonomous systems, meaning the decision making is completely autonomous. But for most cases, uh, where the cost of making a mistake is really high, for example, self-driving cars, we're still not there, right? So despite all the hype around autonomous driving cars, we don't see them on the road today, uh, simply because uh, we don't have enough confidence in them that they will make the right decision under all circumstances. So in many ways, where we are in the industrial landscape is in all the four places, where descriptive, predictive, recommendation, autonomous. And where we see the most value given the current technology is in recommendation system. So most of you might be used to recommendation system from say Google, uh, when they recommend an ad to you or Amazon, when they recommend a product to you. But the way to think about is what is the recommendation that you would like 
a system to make in your setting. And I will go through these examples that we have done in real life uh, in a bit. Okay. Um, so this to sort of, and because we do a lot of customer facing projects, um, we have in some sense the pulse of what's happening in the field. And these are some of the changes that we have seen in the manufacturing landscape over the last uh, several years. Uh, so from one perspective, you have much more of distributed small scale manufacturing. Uh, and especially with COVID, there is increasing demand for resilience and supply chains and people are focusing on local supply chains um, that are more robust and less brittle. Uh, there's certainly a shortage of skilled labor. I mean, anyone who has worked in Midwest knows that most folks don't want to work on the shop floor. Um, that's not sexy anymore. Um, and then we see a movement from OEMs to move from um, to sort of selling the products to product as a service. And then there's always a cost pressure to deal with. And there's a lot of technology out there uh, from IoT and AI to industry and making this what this talk is going to be about. But there are other related topics like advanced robotics and automation, additive manufacturing, worker skill augmentation with AR and VR, uh, new materials and production processes. So in many ways, broadly speaking, AI is applicable to all these technologies. Um, but uh, our focus today is primarily going to be an IoT and AI domains. Uh, just to level set, if you think about what happens in manufacturing, this sort of the end to end supply chain. And just to keeping in mind uh, folks who are not from manufacturing. And today we are primarily going to focus on the core manufacturing part right here in the middle uh, and some on supply chain. So I think um, it was more, I think, it gave a very nice uh, example about uh, predictive maintenance, predictive quality. So I think in, in our experience also, if you look at manufacturing specifically, there's a lot of ask in both predictive maintenance, predictive manufacturing. And I think we we'll also correctly identified two key problems, uh, the remaining useful life estimation. So you're doing your monitoring of your equipment and then you're doing remaining useful life estimation or it can take the form of failure prediction. Uh, they are very related problems. And the other uh, problem that he pointed out, which I think also we see a lot in the field is identifying um, which part is at fault. And, some, and my feeling is that that might be in fact an overall um, a more difficult problem to solve. The problem that we have successfully implemented for some pretty large players is, is what we call the recommendation problem, meaning uh, we recommend what is the right repair. So it's like if you go to a doctor, um, instead of trying to really figure out what's wrong with you, suppose you have a uh, high fever and, um, and it's, not, it's not very serious, the doctor might say, okay, just take a, some sort of a medicine that will reduce your fever. You don't really need to understand the root cause of why you have a fever. So very often in industrial operations, folks are en happy enough with quickly getting back on the road uh, rather than trying to, uh, to solve the cross problem. And from a, from a business uh, perspective, like what is the most uh, beneficial, uh, the, cost, but the cost of developing such a solution could be much less, it cause is much more difficult. So that's something to think about. So um, the other thing to think about when you're thinking about deploying some of this predictive maintenance solutions, especially is a trade-off between false positives and uh, true positives. Right? So you can really tell an algorithm uh, to capture all your failures and predict all your failures. But then what happens is your, your rate of false positive goes up. Right? So you might be, because your algorithm is being very aggressive in tagging failures, it might tag certain situations that are not really failures as failures. So the interesting thing to uh, to balance is what is the right balance for you given the cost of failure. So for example, uh, if you are flying an uh, aircraft, um, then you have to be really, very aggressive. Even if you think it's a very low, low probability of your uh, plane having a trouble in the air, you will flag it down because the cost of failure is really, really, really high. But at the same time, if it's say your, um, your dinky old car, like I had a dinky old car for a long time, when I was in grad school, I didn't really care whether it failed or not. So in that case, the cost of the failure was really not very high for me. And in that case, I would not be very aggressive, right? So I would say, even if my system is telling me this might fail, I'll say I can choose to ignore that unless I'm 100% cost. So this is the sort of trade-off that you need to think about as you deploy your machine learning models in the field. And I think one of those reasons um, we have not seen as much success or the winter of AI or whatever it's being called right now these days, it's because people don't marry the AI machine learning with the business problem that they're trying to solve. And the key to success in all 
operationalization and practical deployments is this marriage between machine learning people and domain experts, between business folks, IT folks, and the AI folks. They sit together in one room and they figure out what is feasible given the data that they have, given the architecture that you have, uh, what makes business sense, and then what can machine learning do? And, in, and if you're designing these processes for your own organizations, my recommendation is to let the business people drive the discussion. Although I'm a machine learning guy, it hurts me to say that, but this is true because they really understand what is the pain point and what has the maximum ROI for them. And once you start having a discussion from that perspective, machine learning folks, they need to understand what is the right problem to solve for this particular situation and they should go ahead and solve it. That's on maintenance. The next is around another area that we, is if you think about the manufacturing process, maintenance and there is operations. So this is the one area I think more missed out, but this, the dispatching problem is an age old problem. Um, and what we did was we brought some really new technology to it. So you might have all heard of uh, AlphaGo and uh, now in chess, um, the machines are so much superior to humans. Right? The ILO score is something that humans can't even aspire to. So, and they use something called deep reinforcement learning uh, to solve uh, the, the chess problem, recommend what is the next move. And if you think about it, this problem is very similar to this dispatching problem in manufacturing, right? So you have uh, an environment where you have a bunch of jobs to do. And if you have an end goal, in chess, the end goal is to win the game against an opponent. In this case, your end goal might be to minimize your lateness or maximize some of the KPI. But given that end goal, can you come up with an optimal strategy? And, and, and we published this paper, I think, uh, a couple of years ago. And clearly, if you use uh, this modern technique of deep reinforcement learning, um, then you can do much better than the existing techniques. So this is around operations. Um, the next one is around uh, quality. So, in qual so, so, uh, so there is predictive quality, I think, uh, more mentioned earlier. But more than predictive quality, another problem that we have seen is uh, folks want to know, can you um, a region, an operational region that is maximized quality? So, so they have uh, can operate an equipment in different operational regimes. But in different operational regimes, uh, given the, the properties of the, uh, the raw material and the environmental settings, you might have different quality output. So if you could, out, if you could model that, and I, I have what I have shown here is essentially uh, artificial data because I can't really use customers' data when I'm giving a talk. But the idea was, can you identify regions in which the, the quality would maximize? And this is, uh, and then you could do that and that becomes a recommendation for the system to within these certain bounds. And if you're within these certain bounds, um, then you can maximize quality. So this is a problem of what we call operating envelope uh, for quality. Um, the next problem is around supply chain. And I think uh, if you go back to uh, the list of challenges we had uh, said we're seeing in the industry, uh, we, one of the things was around uh, making your supply chains much more resilient. Um, at Hitachi, because we are a serious manufacturing company, we have built a pretty uh, robust simulator for supply chain. And one of the challenges in modeling supply chains traditionally has been that people build uh, a distribution model that doesn't really fit in the field. So it's more theoretical than practical. Uh, what a simulator allows you to do is really uh, play with a lot of different assumptions, a lot of different real life scenarios to come up with what would be the right uh, thing to do. And so not only did we come up with a pretty sophisticated simulator uh, for supply chain, uh, and multi echelon means that you have got multiple parties in your supply chain, but we also came up with a new optimization technique that reduces the amount of time it would take for you to come up with a good solution to a supply chain. This is especially true when your supply chains might need to be modified at a very short notice, or you need to, might need to make a decision at a very short notice. For example, if, um, especially in the context of COVID-19, uh, if you anticipate that there's going to be a shutdown or some level of shutdown within your community, then what should you do? What, should, what inventory should you manage? How should you manage inventory? So these sort of questions where the supply chain decisions are much more short term uh, can be addressed in a much better way if you have something like, uh, like this. The next one, um, so now we talked about maintenance, quality, operation, supply chain. Other area where AI plays a prominent role from a manufacturing process itself 
is robotics and automation. And this is uh, where uh, we're using a lot of uh, image data. And suppose you're doing some task, and so we use the image data to see if, there, if the task is being done appropriately. For example, say you are uh, you know, tightening the screw, and if you are getting images in real time, then you can tag if when the uh, robot finishes the job, whether the, the, the screw was tightened properly or not. So this is something uh, that can reduce your defects when you're doing automated work. So this is another area where we have done some interesting work. And I think which is another area where you should think about uh, using machine learning. Uh, finally, uh, on uh, worker, right? So we talked about quality, maintenance, operations, um, supply chain, automation, and uh, on worker automation improvement. It turns out that uh, we can really model a worker's performance. For example, I don't know whether you know this or not, when you drive, and I did this part several years ago, when you drive based simply on a GPS data, uh, we can construct a pretty good driver signature for you uh, as an individual uh, with a reasonable, pretty reasonable accuracy because up in the way you brake, the way you accelerate after a stop sign, and the way you take a right turn, left turn, is all quite unique to you if you put them together. So similarly, if a worker is doing some job, um, so they're manipulating a big machine or whatever, you can create a signature for them. And then what it allows you to do is compare signatures of workers that are really very productive and signatures of workers that are not as productive as you, as your top workers. And then you can use this um, sort of uh, technology to improve the performance of your worker. And especially, uh, this is especially relevant as you talked earlier about one of the challenges that we see, uh, at least in North America and even in Japan, where you don't find uh, sufficient younger workers who want to take take up the shop floor job. Right? So if there, if you can improve performance of your existing workers, it can really uh, help ameliorate that problem. So, um, so this was some of the use cases that we have uh, either done in the field or in the lab or deployed in some industry. Um, in conclusion, uh, where we see in the next stage of industrial AI, and this is a field that has, in my opinion, a lot of promise. Uh, if you do it deliberately, if you don't fall for the hype. And right now, we are in what we're doing is we're optimizing individual processes and machines, right? For example, we talked about uh, doing failure prediction RUL for a particular machine. We're talking about scheduling, we're talking about quality. The next stage, you'll start putting them together. You'll begin to optimize at a factory level, at a line level. Right? How do I plan? When should I? Uh, suppose I have a supply shock coming. Again, going back to the COVID example, and um, and I also know that my few of the machines are likely to fail. There's some probability of failure in the next few days. How do I put all this information together to make the right decision? But where should I produce? What should I produce? What inventory should I carry? Right, so those decisions are going to be at the line level, at the at a particular factory level, and if you might have multiple factories at a multiple factory level, and then even across a vertical. For right? example, um, you're a factory that requires a lot of electricity, and electricity is a there is a, a non-conventional electricity producer which has surplus capacity. That they cannot store, and you then marry your production plans to their energy supply so that you can, um, it's a win win situation for both of you. Um, and this is where we are going with next industrial AI. Um, and a lot of people worry about automation complexity. I think it is still, uh, it's still not, it's still far away from a world where everything is automated. And in fact, our feeling is as you go from controls to operational strategy, the automation becomes even more difficult. The other excess on, on, on difficulty of automation is the number of subcomponents that you are, in, that are involved in the system, but that makes it much more difficult to really uh, model the relationship. So if you're thinking about automation, this is sort of a good way to uh, frame your problem, to see what is uh, automobile today and um, what is not. Um, Another axis that I think I've not shown here is environment. If your environment is very complex, like for example, in driving, right? So it can be snowing, it can be sunny. Um, autonomous driving is, is proving a difficult problem to solve, completely autonomous driving, proving a difficult problem to solve because um, the environment is very, very dynamic. But if your environment is much more 
control. Suppose you're in a clean room where everything is very well controlled and the automation is that's on the topic. Um, I talked about this trade off beginning itself. And I think that's it. Thank you. Um, I wanted to give 10 minutes back to Irene so that I know she had some questions that wanted uh, answering. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Satan, thank you so much. Uh, if you have questions from the audience, uh, please type them into the um, Q&A portion. I do have a couple of questions uh, right now. Uh, one is um, actually for, one is actually for John. John, are you still? Yes, John is here. Um, John, you talked about uh, statistics and, and, and machine learning and, and the, the challenge of linking things like process and technologies and people, et cetera. Um, is it really realistic to expect that managers can actually contribute to the work of data scientists? You may be on mute, John. Yep, John. John, you are on mute, so I know you're talking. Hey, John. John, you are on mute. Huh. Go ahead, John. Now you should be unmuted. Oh, yep. No, we can't hear you, John. Well, while we are trying to fix that, let me turn then to Chayton. Chayton, you talked about um, uh, simulation in supply chains, using AI for predictive maintenance and worker productivity and enhancements. Um, you also mentioned uh, COVID-19 and the disruptions from that. Do you think the COVID-19 and, and the disruptions that we're seeing in remote work, even on the factory floor, do you think that's going to change the trajectory of how AI might be used in industrial systems in, uh, going forward? It's a very good question. I think what uh, sudden system shocks like COVID-19 do is they accelerate some existing trends. So there was a trend towards uh, automation, there was a trend towards uh, using machine learning AI. And so what we're seeing is, in fact, uh, uh, we had sort of a month or so ago, we had meetings um, saying maybe the business would be impacted in a negative way. But what we're seeing is that a lot of customers now are even more keen to figure out what is the long-term strategy uh, wherein the uh, AI can be helpful. And some of the changes that are triggered because of COVID-19 are more geopolitical in nature and they are sort of longer term, especially around supply chains, about resiliency, about localization. Um, and they are here to stay. And to be cost competitive with these uh, new supply chain models, you will see increasing reliance and use of AI is how I see it. Okay, and, and do you think that, the, that, that as you are doing AI, you will need to think about different output mechanisms or feedback mechanisms for remote workers? Yeah, so uh, for many of us who sort of work with laptops and machines, um, uh, remote work is quite feasible. But as we have seen, um, if you, uh, for many jobs require physical work, remote work is still not feasible. So the two technology trends uh, that I think that I see that are relevant, one is what are called cobots. So traditionally robots and humans have worked in separate enclosures. This is partly for safety of humans uh, and partly maybe for the safety of robots. But the new thing that's coming is what is called cobots. So these are robots that work closely with humans. So with that, you would see a reduction in sort of uh, folks who need to be on the shop floor uh, with the machines. The other trend, which is maybe with 5G, is, uh, is a remote control of machines, meaning that robotics via networking. So one of the challenges in robotics, for example, is really because humans are very good, humans are very smart. Whoever tells you that you know, AI is going to replace humans is, is not being uh, really straightforward, right? Because humans are actually pretty good. We are very flexible in how we solve problems. So with uh, networked automation, you, there could be a human at the other end, but not necessarily on the shop floor. So, so, so purely from an automation perspective, 
and work uh, remote work perspective on manufacturing shop flow these are two things that you could see thanks chay uh, 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 it's okay. also an increasing use of ar and vr to help uh, folks uh, figure out what to do great great john are you back on yet i i, I think i may be i don't know if you can hear me yes we can now we can now okay so, okay great so let me go back to the question that was posed to you earlier. And, yes. and that is with, with all the, the very technical aspects to the statistics and the machine learning and the AI, is it really realistic to expect that manufacturer, that managers can really actually contribute to the work of a data scientist? And if so, how? That's an interesting question. And I think there's an intimidation factor here as well. Uh, certainly statistics and machine learning and analysis can be amazingly detailed, but it's all the more reason to ensure that the work is performed in support of the sponsor's goals. Uh, good data scientists totally understand this, uh, or any kind of analyst, and they're adept at distilling the technical questions into business choices so that the material is presented to the, the manager or the executive as an opportunity to guide the organization appropriately. But that is uh, partly dependent upon the data scientist or the analyst to be able to do that. As a person with a PhD in machine learning AI who li who's likely to intimidate uh, I, I would like to say John is spot on, right? In fact, uh, business owners should take charge of the process and they should think of machine learning AI simply as a tool. Um, just like they have a lath machine or they might have a CNC machine, AI is just a tool. Um, and there is the data scientist, a worker who's sort of working on that tool to give you what you want. And if you don't get what you want, you should push back. Good point. So Isaac, Isaac, I, if, if you're still uh, able to contribute, um, you talked about people and processes and technologies. How, how does AI come into all of that when you start thinking about the, the overlap and the collaboration between managers and data scientists and operations people in your, in your company? Um. <clears throat> I think it's it's the you can't replace um, knowledge uh, from the people on the plant floor. Um, I, I know we're seeing a lot these days of the the, um, the old guard retiring, and um, I think I think a lot of times machine learning and AI can can actually help. Um, you know, when those people retire, I've heard stories a lot of stories of guys walking through a plant floor and just by hearing the machine or touching the vibration of the machine. Those guys that have been there for 30 years know how that machine works. Um, and, but those, those guys are going away. And um, I, I think the realization um, that if we have these tools uh, to make us more flexible and, and um, you know, kind of recover that knowledge, I think um, there's a connection right there. Great, great. Well, we don't have any more questions in the Q&A window at this point. We've been answering them from various panelists as we've gone on. So I will turn this back to Lucian for a final wrap up. I appreciate your time. I appreciate the panelists time here. And if you have additional questions, please reach out to us in the in the coming days as you think of things that we sparked in your interests. Uh, and as you have additional questions that we might uh, answer for you. Lucian, are you there? Yes, I am. Sorry about that. So I missed the question. Sorry about that. It's a question. I was saying that we had, we had been answering questions throughout uh, in, the, in the chat window. Uh, we took a couple of questions. I thought I would turn it back to you to the, do the final wrap up. Yes, thank you, Dr. Patrick. Uh, thank you, sure. all the speakers. Thank you, the sponsors. And thank you, the audience that stuck around until the end of the day. It's been a long day. Uh, we got an exciting day tomorrow. Look forward to see all of you. Welcome back. Uh, there is uh, uh, Hitachi's uh, Chief Innovation Officer, Bill Schmarzo, will be talking about the exploiting the power of data. So come on in.
tomorrow and, and, and there's another 12 sessions going on. Uh, appreciate all the support for everybody involved in this. Uh, there's over 95 speakers and uh, several organizations that dedicate a lot of time. So thank you and have a great evening.